Hello, good day, good evening to all of you coming from uh, all corners of the world. It's a real pleasure to, to be here to, um, to chair the opening session. Um, and my name is Christiane Allen, and I'm the um, Executive Secretary of INSA, uh, the International Network for Government Science Advice, which is a global network of practitioners at the interface between science, broadly speaking, and public policy. And through training and research and convening, INSA aims to help structure and strengthen uh, that interface and to coordinate the sharing of insights and lessons across the globe. Um, and of course, INSA has been delighted to be a foundational partner of, uh, of IPO from its very beginning. Um, and so we've endeavored to provide uh, a global perspective um, that we've been able to source from across our network, which is exactly what we're hoping to do um, in a condensed form uh, here today. So I will skip the housekeeping um, because that's been done. And I will apologize in advance for it's quite a windy uh, evening here in Auckland, New Zealand. So I hope that there's not um, too much interference from the neighbor's trees. Uh, but to continue, I'll, I'd like to introduce um, our speakers on this panel. So we've, uh, we've got um, three very esteemed colleagues with us from uh, across the world. Um, Inaya Rahmani is the director of the Research Center for Asian Studies at Universitas in Indonesia. And um, she's been directing a project over the past couple of years, a comparative uh, policy project, looking uh, in particular at inequities um, and how they play out through the pandemic. And hopefully we'll hear from her uh, on some of uh, the details of that project tonight, today. Um, we've also got Rafael Radi, who is the coordinator for the Honorary Scientific Advisory Group to the government of uh, Uruguay. Uh, and of course, Uruguay was um, quite famously one of the uh, early first movers in the, in the pandemic in the early days. And um, uh, Rafael, of course, was instrumental in, in, um, in those policies coming into play. Um, and finally, we've got Sir Peter uh, Gluckman, the president of the International Science Council um, and uh, of course, many of you may know him too as um, uh, the founding chair of INSA, our organization. So we're delighted to have Peter with us here today. Um, the International Science Council has been involved in a project over the past couple of years, well, many projects, but over the past couple of years during the pandemic to, to really look at and plot not what was going on day to day, but really looking forward um, and looking at what some of the scenarios might be uh, in helping us get out of it. Um, and so hopefully he will bring some of those thoughts to us uh, here today. So I would like to structure our talk in the following way. Um, we will do two rounds of questions initially um, that I will moderate and start off with. The first is a question that goes to all of the speakers um, by way of introductory uh, remarks. And um, their remarks will respond to a first question and a second round will be questions specific to each of them. So let me just kick off. And I think what I'll do is I'll move from region to region and then the global perspective with Peter. So Anaya, I'd like to start with you um, and then move from there to Raphael and then to Peter with one sort of global question to all of you. Um, starting with Anaya's response and remarks. So, and, and here's what I'd like to, what I'd like to discuss. So the, the IPPO obviously is dedicated to analyzing and understanding social aspects of uh, social policy aspects, whether they're impacts and drivers of the pandemic and the variety of contexts in, um, that enable lesson drawing. So from the perspectives of your own regions and your own areas of work, what are some of those lessons or observations in the social aspects of the pandemic that have emerged in the past two years? And importantly, how transposable do you think um, that such observations and lessons might be globally, whether they are transposable or whether they're not, whether you could talk to us a little bit about that. Can I start with you, Anaya? Yes, uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much for the time given. I'll try to be as effective as possible in answering your question. Uh, while um, my answer is based on an 11 country study in Southeast Asia plus Bangladesh, uh, and there are deep historical context and immersive uh, experiences 
uh, that each researcher and academics had by being part of the research, even before they were part of the research. So these are academics working in inequalities, uh, social vulnerability, social work, etc. cetera. Uh, and while we uh, are uh, ingrained into uh, our local institutions, we agree that the pandemic has exposed uh, pre-existing vulnerabilities and inequalities and even accelerated uh, this to the surface for us as social scientists and those coming from the humanities uh, to look at the experience of everyday life uh, on a more broad, broader scale due to the pandemic. And we also agreed that uh, in cases in which uh, either the state or the federal government's uh, policymaking cannot reach uh, local levels, communities allying with academics and uh, people from the medicine sector, health sector, health worker, those in the logistics, those on the front line during the pandemic uh, was built, was strengthened and uh, those coming from those backgrounds tried to fill in pockets in which policies did not reach them. Uh, so these are people uh, from uh, within their everyday context, from professional backgrounds, from uh, homemakers working together to make sure that basic social services and health services can uh, be accessible. And the irony of the matter is uh, these kinds of community engagement were not designed uh, top down. There were initiatives, local initiatives that emerged in response to a crisis that I think is also relevant in other contexts outside of Southeast Asia. Uh, and such uh, initiatives could be made more sustainable if they were more legitimized, more uh, given more resources by means of policy making, so that these local initiatives can be mainstreamed into uh, larger scale. So that's a bit of uh, insights from Southeast Asia. And these initiatives are also inclusive. In fact, women uh, and vulnerable people who have lost their jobs were actually on the front line and there is a kind of everyday, um, everyday uh, equalizing effects uh, because people band together in the face of crises. So that's a bit of insights from the study that I led together with uh, the Global Development Network. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Anaya. And we'll come back to some of that to probe it a little further, and in particular, um, notions of, of scaling up and, and um, as you've pointed out, sort of what it takes to legitimize these types of, of initiatives. Um, but for now, if I could uh, turn to, um, to to Raphael, um, could we hear from from you on on the same the same question? What have you observed uh, in terms of lessons, and 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 what what of those might be transposable uh, globally or not? Hello to everybody. Thank you, Christian and Ingsa, and International Public Policy Observatory, for the invitation. And it's glad I'm glad to share this time with uh, such a nice group of colleagues. Just to give a little bit of background, uh, I'm a simple university professor, uh, an MD PhD, that was called by the government to assemble a group of people to advise to the government through the pandemics. This was a new government that just started by the time coronavirus arrived to the country. So uh, we sort of serve as a group to help in the initial response. And we assembled a group of 60 scientists. And I must say this was a broadly interdisciplinary group ranging from mathematics all the way to intensive care physicians. So I, this is the first thing I would like to say, uh, the creation of highly uh, diverse interdisciplinary scientific groups in a pandemic uh, turned to be a really strong tool to deal with this uh, situation. Uh, so uh, we, we experienced uh, in our advice, advisory work and through the time by the reactions of the society, which at the beginning was really shocking to us how much the society was responding to the scientist advice, we perceive that this independent scientific analysis from the government, and we clearly separated the advice from the decision maker. I made this very clear since the beginning with the government and the president of the nation, that we didn't want any political interference on, of, on our work. And there was no political interference. And we made all these reports transparent and open to the public and to the press. We generated close to 90 reports through the 15 minutes, uh, 15 months that we acted, 
and all these 90 reports were uh, posted immediately in the presidential website. So everybody could see what this group was advising irrespective of whether the government would or would not take 100% of our recommendations. That brought a lot of transparency to the process. And then later the academic literature confirmed that this was a valid strategy. I would like to just show one slide because I believe uh, this is relevant for this. And this is, uh, these are three academic papers that came out in the last few months uh, to BNAS, uh, trust in scientists in times of pandemic, panel evidence from 12 countries, then transparent communication about negative features of COVID vaccines, decreases acceptance, but increase in trust. So in the long term, it's a good thing. And finally, in science, we should trust expectations and compliance across the nine countries during the COVID pandemic. So it became very clear and to the question Christian was asking whether this can be transposable to other countries. Yes, the answer is yes. Having broad interdisciplinary scientific teams that are independent from the government and then can provide independent advice is a good thing and a good tool for the pandemics in terms of society response to both non-pharmacological interventions as well as the vaccine vaccination program. Science visibility as a second point became very relevant uh, in a country like Uruguay, in which we have a, a, a solid but small scientific community uh, for the first time in the history of our country, science was visible for the population and we created uh, or we um, exposed the concept that science is part of a human right that was in dialogue with uh, the human right to health. So science and health were dialoguing as part of a broader concept of human rights as they are in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it was just, just not a matter of a few people working on laboratories isolated from the rest of the society. We found that the resilience and preparedness of the health systems was very important at all levels. And actually in the different phases of the pandemic we had in our country, we uh, challenged uh, at some point, the primary, the secondary and the tertiary levels and all of them were as important. So there was a lot of focus in February and March 2020 on intensive care units, but for us, for our strategy, putting a lot of efforts on the primary level to contain the way was essential. Of course, at some point of the pandemic, the tertiary level became very important, but that was one year, one year later. We found at the social level, the relevance of social security networks, um, um, uh, social security networks were very important to uh, keep um, people uh, with education, um, food, health. Uh, however, even though we have a large social network, social security, there were about 10% of the population, these are our calculations, that was left kind of out uh, for some time because they are in informal jobs or they didn't have enough time in works to have enough social security to help them through the process. So we estimated about 10% of the population that suffered the most because of these issues. Uh, of course, this was among the lowest in the South American continent, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. We need still need to work on that. Um, two more things, uh, just to round up, we avoided through the process uh, or the pandemic phases hard or prolonged lockdowns. In fact, we didn't have one. Uh, our committee was pretty much um, trying to avoid that, uh, except in, under a very exceptional circumstance. But at the end, we didn't have one obligatory lockdown. There were some voluntary confinement at the very beginning. As we know that this affects the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable situations and increases inequalities. So we saw a lot of impact in our region, not in our country, because of sort of hard lockdowns that created a lot of, um, a lot of further problems uh, through the pandemic. And, and we can come back to that as well, um, because I do want to get into how you did um, look at and deal with those vulnerabilities and um, address, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of 
how hard a lockdown was and understand how people needed the social network and protections and, and how that was put into place. But I'll turn to Peter, um, Sir Peter Gleckman um, next and just get your overview, Peter, of, of the types of social aspects, um, whether drivers or impacts of the pandemic that you've seen from your perspective at the ISC in the last couple of years. I'll talk about the project per se in the second round, sure. Christiane, I haven't used time now, except to say that over the last year, we must have interviewed God knows how many hundred people in structured ways to get a sense of the broad range of impacts of the pandemic. But just making some sweeping generalizations, and it's hard to generalize without thinking of specific countries. I think in many countries, the initial and even prolonged response was dominated very much by a narrow view of health and the control of epidemiologists and so forth and virologists. And it was very hard for other parts of government to get a voice in. And I think there is there were it took and even as the pandemic evolved it was quite variable as to how quickly other inputs became particularly social science but also economic uh, some people economic uh, diplomatic and other inputs came into play uh, i think that uh, in some countries and we can all think of countries the overwhelming rhetorical power of numbers, either in the media or from politicians, came to dominate in the public narrative, whether that without any discussion of uncertainties, unknown assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the mainstream media played it up a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that the failure to evolve inputs in many countries, particularly around mental health, particularly around social care, particularly around education and the impact of the digital divide, and particularly the issues of minority groups, particularly in relationship to getting vaccine access in many countries, was a real issue. I can, I'll come back to vaccines later in my second round. I think one of the big issues that's emerged in our work is one that governments have enjoyed the, the authority that comes with emergencies. And that that has led to a, a shift in attitudes to democracy with a rising role of, of autocracy, even in democratic countries, with a loss of trust and transparency. I'm pleased how Raphael emphasized the importance of trust and transparency, because I think in countries where that has been diminished, and it's been diminished for other reasons I'll come to in a moment, uh, you, uh, we'll start to seeing a loss of social cohesion uh, potentially out of it. One of the issues is, which we've all learned, which I think is key to the social science, is, is the relationship between decision making, the political cycle, the politicization of knowledge, which happened in many countries, and, and the role of disinformation. And I think all of that has fueled some rather interesting implications for other existential crises of the future, climate change and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we cannot ignore the fact that the economic impact in the short term and the medium term has been K-shaped. Some places, some people have done very well and many people, particularly those in the gig economies and in the marginal economies have done very badly. And so that, and now we're into an inflation phase related to things like supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's some real issues. Joanna, in her initial introductory remarks, talked about the wish for COVID to be an inflection point. It's interesting. I, I thought that there'd be more commentary when we've talked to governments about that. Most of them are still trying to pretend it's returning to business as usual. And the conversation over a reset point has disappeared, which was common in the first few months when it was seen that this pandemic might be relatively short. But as the pandemic's gone on, people just want it to be over and they're not thinking in terms of big structural change and they were, were 18 months ago. Add to that now, and we should all remember the horrors that are going on in Ukraine at the moment, and realize they're not disconnected fully from the pandemic. 
uh, one of the probable geopolitical consequences of a loss of attention on other matters by diplomats. Uh, and, and just as the pandemic highlighted the weakness of the multilateral system, this, uh, the Ukraine crisis has certainly done it. Mm -hmm. And so we actually know that we have a crisis, a fundamental flaw that the multilateral system from the 1945 era is no longer fit for purpose. But tragically, the increased nationalism, which was already there at the beginning of the pandemic, if you think about how the WHO acted to what's happening now, is actually making substantive change much harder. And of yeah. course, that's, that, that, that we saw the issue, oh, I come back to later on about vaccine distribution, but I think we need to recognize that this double hit of COVID followed by the start of what might well be the second Cold War has real implications for the ongoing resolution of the pandemic and particularly for the sustainability agenda in many sure. ways. And I could talk yeah. about that at length, but I won't now. Thank you. Thank you. And we will come back. Um, so what I'll do is I, I do have a, a, a couple more questions for, um, for each of you. Um, uh, but I am also just going to point out that uh, to audience members that if they would like to just pop any of their own questions into the chat, um, we'll be monitoring that as well. And I can um, sprinkle through with mine and and those coming from the audience. So, but let me turn back to Anaya. Um, and and it's good. Peter provides us an interesting segue to come back to you because he has said that uh, he pointed out that um, we witness government uh, governments. Um, enjoying the authority that came with the emergency. And certainly we have seen that. And yet um, you, by contrast, have talked about uh, where, where people, where communities, where grassroots sort of fill the gap in places. Um, so tell us a bit more about that, um, if you could. Um, I'm interested in how that, well, first of all, the problem of scale up that you've pointed out and whether or not in these past two years since you started your, your, your project, you've seen any success stories around scaling up those grassroots, but also this notion of legitimizing the grassroots efforts. So in scaling them up, some of them need to be picked, you know, picked as the winners, so to speak, and, and, and legitimized somehow. And I'm interested in the process of, of how that came, came to be, if you've, if you've seen it at all. Could you give us some specific examples if you're seeing them? Yeah, I'll answer your two questions. The first is, I think I agree with Peter that the pandemic does give um, uh, a precedence or um, a permission for the government, especially uh, in strong states, to uh, increase surveillance, to, um, to uh, apply repressive policies, to restrict mobilities. But in countries where um, the elite part of the government, uh, the political elites, political parties have uh, relative competition, then there is no strong state. It means that there is an internal faction and competition within the government. So the policies keep changing, even though there is a nationwide um, implementation of mobility restrictions. Uh, on in regards to your uh, second question, uh, Christian, um, it's a paradox, paradox meaning um, on one hand, um, in uh, the context of a neoliberal government, um, there is always uh, pockets and those who cannot access um, social and public services. But on the other hand, because the state cannot, um, can no longer ensure um, services to all citizens uh, because private uh, health services are much faster in responding to commercial commercialization of health services. This means that there are uh, areas in which there is relatively low intervention. Pockets in which um, it, the government cannot reach are also the pockets that the commercial and private sectors are not interested in because they are not out of pocket patients that um, can be able to pay for those health services. Mm -hmm. So there is um, there is and there is movements and initiatives for everyday politics of ordinary people uh, to uh, practice um, redistribution of access. It's an irony because neither the government nor uh, the private sector is interested to take care of vulnerable people. So um, it's um, and <laughs> the risk of online meeting indeed. 
Um, and um, in this vacuum, uh, it's not a so, it's never a social vacuum for us social scientists yeah. because it means there's a new range of emerging data that we need to study. But I agree with you, Christian. But uh, within these success stories or initiatives, it means that we're also reproducing inequalities because it means that if there are uh, certain genders perhaps women, or those working th uh, through the mosque channels because it's a strong religious community, there are always exclusionary effects for those not part of the community. Because right. these informal networks work with, with, within uh, community-based movements, it means that when we scale up, it means there is inevitably some exclusionary effects. So when policymakers on a local level or neighborhood level and mainstream these initiatives into uh, state channels or federal government channels, it means that the initiatives need to make sure, need to be made sure that they include as diverse um, uh, members as possible while barring the logic, the social logic of including and uh, being more resilient on a local level. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give it back to you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And 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 thank you for uh, for your own resilience and <laughs> being able to respond with some uh, some other uh, unplanned interventions. Um, I don't see any questions coming through from the audience just yet. So I'll just continue with my own um, and turn back to Raphael. And again, linking from what we've just heard from Anaya as well. Um, I want to talk about this idea of vulnerability and sort of the informal, um, the, the, the informal sector that you had mentioned as well. Now you gave us a kind of a behind the scenes view of um, the science advisors uh, group that was advising government. And within that, um, you said that it was very multidisciplinary. Can you tell us a bit about how government um, uh, accepted that advice that was more about the inequalities this, the, uh, of uh, social impacts, as opposed to, as Peter talked about, you know, the rhetoric of numbers um, and the health sector itself. Was there, uh, were they receptive? Did you note government receptivity? Or was it complex to get those messages across that inequality really exacerbates pandemic? And this is something deeper that needs to be dealt with. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think that was uh, one of the toughest part of, of, of the advice. And in fact, uh, as Peter said, initially, there was a lot of focus on health, epidemiology, virology. Uh, and then um, we start growing in terms of reports and advice in terms of the socioeconomic impact. But even our narrative was predominated at the beginning with the health issues directly related to the medical aspects of the pandemic and then the 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 health the, the actually the mental uh, impact uh, mental. Uh, not not directly related to the infection per se as well as all the other non covid uh, health issues that were accumulating over time as well as the social inequities were uh, a matter of discussion uh, after the first 6 months i would say uh, we were able to create a subgroup within our group to deal with these social, economic, behavioral, mental health issues, and that was important. And then uh, a spin-off of that was um, a network, a national uh, research network for the social economic impact of the pandemics that's still um, um, working. Uh, but um, I think that that was the most difficult part of um, the transfer, uh, uh, transfer of information and advice because it directly impacted uh, government, um, economy policies and social policies, um, which were a little bit beyond what uh, the government thought was our initial uh, task, which was dealing with the propagation of the infection. Uh, so that was, uh, there was some tension, uh, especially around uh, March and April 2021, when we did actually have our first big wave with the gamma variant. I must say that the gamma variant uh, of the variants of concerns, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omicron, for us, the gamma variant was a big issue, which was originated initially in northern Brazil. And then when we are talking about regional, 
one of the weaknesses our region have, and I'm not going to talk about other countries, but I'm going to talk about the region, is that while being a, a big region, each country had its own public health policies. And so in the middle of a global process, having individual responses turned mm. not to be a good thing. In mm -hmm. fact, we have a thousand kilometers of frontier, dry frontier with Brazil. And it was an, always a big challenge for us to keep our own policy because we really needed a binational or trinational or multinational health policy, but it was we were not able to consolidate that. So at the end of the day, each country did what you know each government decided to be done. But the pandemic was global. So that was a big weakness for our region. And one more thing I would like to say to round up this part, and it's not may not be directly linked to your question, but I think it's important. Our group was instrumental in avoiding partisan division in the pandemic. We clearly okay. said from the beginning, the partisan division was another risk factor in top of the pandemic. Uh, so we worked really hard for that. And we had tensions right and left all the time. It was really annoying. It was really boring. But at the end of the day, we left uh, with um, same level of acceptance from all the parties in terms of where scientific advice did to handle the pandemic. So partisan division is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going to turn back to Peter, um, but also Peter try to marry up some of the questions that I see coming through here, as well as uh, some of the comments co um, that, that Raphael just brought up. And what it's making me think is um, the preparedness for the next pandemic. So I want to turn to you and ask you about your, your, COVID's, uh, your COVID scenarios project, about how the ISC um, a group of experts sort of sees us seeing our way through this. But I suspect that within those scenarios, we may be seeing something that Tony Gallagher has pointed out, which is the preparedness for the next one. Are, what, what is the role that strong systems play or have played and how can we uh, prepare them to um, be resilient for, for the next scourge? That, well, I think there's some very face. deep questions which I'll come to. Can, can, I, can I just say comment. one more thing in marrying up Raphael's um, comments and that is the transboundary issue um, is making me think that the preparedness is not only potentially national but also transboundary treaties agreements that kind of thing and and now i'll let you go thanks peter the project i'm going to talk about briefly was started in december 2020 when the first vaccines appeared and you remember the political narrative at that time was the pandemic is all over vaccines have appeared and in response to that the international science council in conjunction with the un disaster risk reduction and WHO decided to set up a project to look ahead over the next five years and look in a multi-dimensional way at the pandemic and how it would evolve depending on vaccine and therapeutic coverage in different ways. And the report, and I'll come to the report in a moment, but to say it will be released, it's a giant document which will be released on May the 17th in Geneva, but the, it, it, it was very much a very structured interview of many hundreds of people and, and, and experts in many different domains. And it looked at, at COVID-related issues, non-COVID-related health, obviously being huge issues on health capacity, on social well-being, education, social care, inequality, institutions, governmental stability, social cohesion and trust, micro and macroeconomic issues, sustainability issues, impacts for the next for the next pandemic, the geopolitical issues, and in particular the state of the multilateral system to actually deal with pandemics and other existential risks. And I, I, I just to go straight to the question that Christian came to, Clearly, the WHO and the international health regulations were not fit for purpose. The IHR were last written in 2005, when molecular biology was in its infancy, and Ebola hadn't happened, and SARS hadn't happened, and they were clearly inappropriate for what how for this for this new raft 
of viral zoonoses. Sadly, two and a half years on, we've only got to the point where they've agreed on who shall be the chair of the groups that of the WHO companies, where, uh, countries that will actually look at how the IHR should be reviewed. And there are countries that are pointing out with glee that it's too, even if you, they could change the regulations of two years before they come into effect. So we have a very dysfunctional multilateral system. And I'm heavily involved, and I can't comment more on alternate uh, on the issues because we've got very distinctive positions from the, the different geostrategic poles at the moment on what should happen. And, it's, and, and given what's happened in Ukraine, I do not hold, I'm not particularly optimistic. In, in the second part of the report, which is just being completed now, uh, we are looking at a number of different dimensions in terms of policy lessons uh, and policy recommendations. And while I don't want to go into all of them now, they've really fallen under a limited number of headings, all related to what we've already been discussing. First of all, the need for a pluralistic and evolving approach to emergencies. And if we think about pandemics, they're always global or they're always regional, they're never just national. And the issues of what needs to be in a new pandemic convention, treaty, or admission change in the IHR, the whole issue of what's needed there is about early notification, early genetic material sharing, which is complicated because of uh, the Noigoya protocol. There's a whole lot of things here, uh, inspections, sharing, the issues of the fact that uh, at the moment, there's no register of level four laboratories around the world. There's no scientific support for the convention of biological warfare. There's a whole raft of related issues. Secondly, and we've already talked about the length, the fundamental issue of inequality. Inequality is exacerbated by the pandemic, and the pandemic is exacerbated for those, uh, as have already been said, who are in marginalised conditions. And we've seen that in every country around the world. There's a lot in the, in the report about risk assessment, risk, uh, a preemptive risk assessment, which failed in, every, in most countries except those who had had SARS uh, previously in this pandemic. And, has, and the issues of how risk assessment is integrated into policy decision making is a, a big issue. And I noticed David Spiegelholters on the on the call, who's on our advisory board. There's a lot about science advice and the issues of who has access and when, and who and the structures around it. Although it has to be said that the issues of where the structures needed for emergencies and the structures needed for normal forms of science advice, it's not obvious that they are the same. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about the need to build systemic trust and the issues that happen when trust breaks down for the reasons we've already discussed. There's a lot about science and diplomacy because if we look at what's been successful in the pandemic, it's been the collaboration of international scientists and in both the public and private sector to produce vaccines, good vaccines, very remarkably, rapidly and quickly. Yeah. And that's the one thing that we should celebrate in this. At the same time, there's all the issues we've talked about already yeah. of disinformation. Yeah. There's the multilateral system. I'm not going to get into that now. No, and there's a discussion, which I know some of you are already involved in. I've been in discussions already about how learning lessons, unfortunately, mu must find a way of avoiding the blame game so okay. we can actually make progress, pro progress more quickly. Because mm -hmm. if we get caught up in the blame game, which inevitably the political process will, and the media process will move towards, then we have a real issue. And yeah. if I can just give one more advertisement, I think within all of this, it's quite obvious that social science is also a global knowledge discipline, uh, sharing, which is needed. And one of the things the ISC is doing through its commission on, on mission-led science for sustainability, which is led by Irina Bukova and, and Helen Clark, is actually looking for how we can get more mission-led science across the global south and global north to mm -hmm. deal with the social science aspects of sustainability. And, the, and of course, that does include human health and pandemics. Mm -hmm.
No, thank you, Peter, and thank you for um, uh, that uh, that advertisement for the social sciences as well, because of course you're you've you've got the choir in the room here <laughs> listening to well, you. I've been converted by you, haven't I? <laughs> But as we know, the social sciences are broad and very diverse. And if I can, indulge me in coming to um, a question that I think is probably coming more from the um, critical social sciences. And it's a question that I see in the, in the chat here, which has interested me um, all along watching the discursive changes that have occurred uh, during the pandemic from governments. Um, we've seen massive change in terms of how things have been uh, framed, how things have been articulated. And um, the person asks, what happened to Build Back Better? How did that become, basically, how did Build Back Better move to get back to normal, a sense of normal? And there's a lot in that, um, uh, the, the hope of building back better and using the pandemic as a, a, a critical juncture for catalytic change um, to, no, no, we've had enough, let's just get back to normal. So if I could just turn to Anaya, we only have about 10 minutes left, but Anaya, does that, have you seen that play out in, in your region, in the countries that you've studied? A, a, a real discursive change in the framing of government uh, of the pandemic and, and what concrete impact do you think that it, it has had in terms of how government frames things and how they're thinking about things? From build back mm -hmm. better to, to, to get back to normal. Back to normal, yeah. Um, the main question that the report, try, the research tried to answer is how has the pandemic changed the relationship between state and civil society uh, by taking the case of social sciences, which is, as you have said, a very diverse. Um, and uh, some of the uh, countries did mention that there is uh, an um, attempts by the government, especially those with internal competition, uh, between the elites, use media, especially like the case of the bot that attacked our discussion today, uh, to herd uh, these kinds of sentiments online uh, and uses media as an apparatus to build a framework about uh, getting back to normal because the status quo uh, is much easier to sustain rather than trying to band together and try to do something during this crisis. Uh, in the meantime, civil society in different in each country because some civil societies are quite vibrant, uh, like in the case of Indonesia and the Philippines, because there is uh, interactions with other countries and other civil societies outside of the countries. Um, in comparison to Singapore and Malaysia, it's quite uh, secluded or isolated in some um, local areas, but in terms of national civil society movements, uh, it's very difficult to go against the state. Uh, and this is reflected in the kinds of uh, mainstream media discourses as well. Uh, the, the stronger the state, usually the media is also more industri industrialized uh, in comparison to countries with a vibrant civil society with also plural media uh, platforms and systems. Uh, I'd like to return to Peter and uh, Raphael's uh, points in interdisciplinary and plurality um, to build back fair or redistribution uh, in equal access. So we need to address it together uh, and ally with those uh, with similar interests, whether in the government, science community, or journalists or civil society. Uh, pluralizing epistemic approaches, diversifying interdisciplinary approaches, and interdisciplinary, not multi or trans, because we're not going beyond anything we haven't addressed the everyday problems that is poverty, uh, inequalities in the household and uh, in the public spaces. So by pluralizing, by diversifying, we're directing our energy into redistributing access and um, access uh, and uh, wealth uh, to um, face crises, not uh, as far as uh, another pandemic, but also what's happening today, which is climate change, uh, fairer and greener and also shortening our distribution channels, making sure that we're lowering emissions on an everyday level. And this really needs banding together of scientists uh, from various disciplines. I'll uh, return back to you, Christian, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yes, thank you. I see that you're engaging as well with, uh, with the chats coming through. Sure, sure, exactly that. Build back fairer, build back greener. Is has the pandemic been a catalyst? So maybe I'll turn to, to Raphael in your region, and I know this. Um, is putting you on the spot a bit, but in your region, have you seen evidence that the pandemic is a catalyst for fairer, for 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 a a, um, a shared sense of better 
um, rather than um, somebody pointed out uh, the potential for a, a capitalism of a disaster economy. So it, is it build back fairer, really? Yeah, in, in it is actually a tough question and, and, and it's very hard. Uh, in general terms, I believe, like Peter said, that at the beginning, when we thought that this was not going to last for so long, and I think that there was a window of opportunity, that now I think it's lost for the time being at the government level. For governments, pandemic utilized 40 to 50% of their time. In our country, this is a five-year term. So mm. the two out of the five-year terms is over. So now everything needs to be done in three years for the next election. Unfortunately, that is what's happening throughout the region. This is what I see. So the governments are more interested in, um, it's, it's a complicated discussion and reflection to build what better when you have so little time to accomplish what you promised to the society that you were going to do. So I think that the reflection, I think that the, the reflection is going to go through the academic channels, the international um, organizations like, like this organization to put new elements and with a time frame which will not be so fast. Uh, try to put these ingredients after we have finalized most of the pandemic to, to reinitiate in a fresher view. I don't see that governments that are actually running and have utilized 40 to 50% of their time are willing to do all of this at this time. So yeah. I'm not particularly optimistic on that. What I do see though, that there are many good reflections on the academic and scientific systems that should be transfer to the um, decision making people in for the near future so in, this, in this in this sense scientific advice i believe continues to be an important tool but the time frame will take longer than we all hope mm -hmm. unfortunately no, good points thank you for that peter 30 seconds we really have to wrap up any any last reflections from from you well i think i just want to pick up on 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 rafael's last point First, we've got to remember that many countries have lost their fiscal flexibility, that they actually, particularly in the global south, they've lost totally their flex fiscal flexibility, and that plays into the story. See, we've got to remember there's a lot of countries where vaccine rates are very low, coverage is very low, and we sh shouldn't assume that we've seen the end of the evolution of the virus. There's no inherent scientific reason why the, vac why the virus will, at this stage, in reaching into a new host population, evolve towards being less, less virulent. So we need to be sure of that. Thirdly, I think, and, and I think we're a long way, I saw a question in the question, COVAX and Act A have not actually performed particularly well. So I think we need to actually be honest and say the multilateral system has been very weak, even in the bit that was set up to really do it well. Yeah. And finally, and I've been on the phone with UN leaders over most of the last week, the fear of what this is doing to the sustainability agenda and the climate change agenda is horrific. And I think that keeping those agendas on plat on on any sort of reasonable track i was talking to nick stern about it last night is a real real concern yeah that that that, that just for the reasons that rafael has said and now with the diversion the tragic diversion of ukraine the ability to keep the multilateral system on track to deal with the tragedies of the, and the risks of the global commons is very very high yeah. indeed so yeah. I don't want to be pessimistic, but I think that we've got to be honest and say how we keep policy focus on these issues is going to yeah. be very hard. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you, Anaya, uh, to Peter and Raphael for, for your comments, for engaging with our audience, and thank you for the audience for engaging uh, with us. I'll hand it back. Thanks so much.